I am here to talk about Elliot's book, about her writing process, but there's also something a little bit unusual about the two of us being up here in that, what, eight or nine years ago, Elliot, uh, Elliot was um, well, not that long a ago, student yeah. of mine. And, well, something, some years ago. Some, yeah, some time ago, Elliot was one of my students in the MFA program at Brooklyn College. By the way, I see some other former students of mine, and we must pause to for me to say um, blessings and love to all of you, including the aspiring writers who don't happen to have been my students. Here's to, here's to your brilliant futures. Here's hoping that you'll let me stumble up here when your own brilliant first novels come out. I will probably need some help getting up on the stage by then, but you're young. I'll do that. It, it, seems, um, it seems like we should, before we talk in detail about the book and the process of writing it, talk a little bit about being a writer and a student. Um, when I do Q&As, one of the more popular questions is, Mr. Cunningham, do you think writing can be taught? By which they usually mean, Mr. Cunningham, why don't you admit that writing cannot be taught and MFA programs are just a big scam meant to give jobs to nat yes or writers who otherwise would have to be waiters or bartenders. There's a lot of skepticism out there about MFA programs. Um, and I would love for you, if you would, to talk a little bit about um, just about the experience in, in general. I mean, we talk about, about our relationship. But, but, um, hey, okay, I made Elliot. Well, I created Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> I did not Let's spell. Let's just say it. No, 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 no. She was illiterate. She, she was hopeless, and I have to build her up into what you see before you. Um, so we can just kind of we can move on from there. But um, just for a few minutes, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the experience of, of, of being in a program that presumes that if writing cannot necessarily actually be taught, there's some reason to study it formally for a couple of years with the faculty and other students. Yeah. Well, you know, visual artists, it's a, most visual artists know that when they're training, they copy the masters and they go kind of through an apprentice period. And it seems, um, sort of acceptable in the visual arts. Um, and it seems to me it's equally useful in writing. And um, I know in our MFA program, all of us, I think it's fair to say, we're innately talented. I mean, we clearly wrote something good enough to get into the program. And I think part of that innate talent probably has a lot to do with having an ear for language. You know, you, you have an ear as a reader. You have to be able to kind of read the modulations and tone in work. And then you, you start to sort of find your own voice. But a lot of it is kind of hearing how those sentences work. So I think you can't necessarily give someone a good ear, but there's still so much that you learn and improve upon in a program. And part of it is learning to read like a writer, because a lot of, you read differently once you're kind of reading for craft. Um, you're, not that you're not attuned to things like theme and character, but you start to notice things like, huh, is this story ending on a minor note? Is this, um, you know, how is this, you know, first person narrator working in this story. You know, you, and so, um, and I remember the first thing you said to us in our very first craft class, the first semester, on the very first day you said um, that you know immediately, almost in the first paragraph of a story or a book, if the writer has authority on the page. And part of it's, he said, Michael said it's like dancing, that um, you want your partner to lead you. And if the writer has authority, you just sort of feel like you're willing to be led, you kind of, sense that you'll just go with wherever the story is taking you. And I think when, uh, as a reader, you sort of resist what you're reading, or you have that sense of, I don't really buy this, or I'm not, it's probably because there's just not enough authority on the page, and, and you, as the reader, can't follow the steps. Or, you know what I mean? You're not being led. Yeah. So he kept saying, it's like a dance. It's like a dance. And I love that analogy, partly because it's musical, because I feel very strongly about the sound of language. Um, but in terms of figuring out what that authority means and how you can sort of 
find it. Um, I think we all learned a lot. I mean, I, there's absolutely no way I would be sitting here with a finished book if I hadn't gotten an MFA. And that's partly, yes, because Michael and everyone else who was in the program taught really well, but it's just partly the nature of being in a classroom with other remarkably gifted people, <coughs> reading each other's work, giving each other feedback, um, starting to notice things on the line level, pushing ourselves to revise. I mean, I think that's the, the other thing you learn so much about it. You just learn to revise your own work and to be really rigorous about it. You know, editing your own stuff. And Michael, I remember he'd you know look at things and he'd say, "Yeah, it's almost there, but it needs another pass." You know, it's almost there, but it needs another pass. And my first published story, um, I think, went through forty-five drafts in three years. You know, um, and the first draft came out in like two days. But just because you can write five thousand words in two days doesn't mean you're anywhere near done. You know what I mean? Like the revision is ninety percent of it, probably more than ninety percent of it. So. I'm rambling, but anyway, I'm very pro MFA program, and I think um, I mean, it doesn't even have to be a program. I just think the workshop model works. It worked for me. I, I think I think it's it's at least as much about bringing. Um, do we need a little uh, sound adjustment? Yeah, we just. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Um, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, can you hear me now? Sorry, was I too quiet, too loud, too emphatic? Shall I, shall I should synopsize we... what she just said? Um, <laughs> okay. uh, you should do it. At, you, you know what you should do is you, when I was reading and you were sitting there, I kept thinking uh, of Michael Bloomberg when he has this um, sign language translator on stage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Bring in the awesome Michael Rossini. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah
this novel, which is in fact fiction. Um, right. <clears throat> another favorite question um, in, during Q and A's is how much of the book was autobiographical? Ninety-six percent. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's let's then let's talk about. Then no. Let's talk about. It. Well, I, I want to. I just want a, a brief preface. Um, when people ask that question, I feel like, well, a couple of things. First, there's no such thing as an entirely non-autobiographical right. novel because your material comes from your life. The mother in the book may not resemble your mother, but your experience of mothers has come from somebody. Your experience of, of light fixtures in, 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 in great institutions like this has come from some, some from the carpet, everything at all. You, you can't help but write about what the world has shown you. So the question really is the degree to which you take directly from what you've experienced, and the degree to which you kind of use what you've experienced to spin and alter and fudge and finesse. And I think, I think what they're really asking when they ask, is this biographical, is how did you do this? Right. How did you take the inanimate material of ink and paper and make this happen? How, and I think, I think how much of it is autobiographical is actually a simply even more interesting question, which is, where did this come from? Right. Well, I think the best fiction defamiliarizes the familiar. And, um, I use that. And familiarizes <laughs> the unfamiliar. You know, you want to, um, if you're reading about a place you've never been, you want to feel like you know the place through what you're reading. So it's making the, what's unfamiliar familiar to you. But at the same time, Defamiliarizing the film familiar in the sense that you may have um, you may actually have met someone like that or been to that place, but you're seeing it some kind of fresh perspective on it. And I think um, in terms of how you do that, I think it's you know the imagination is a powerful tool, but particularly when you write in the first person, I think there's even more of a tendency for the reader to want to conflate the author's experience and the narrator's experience. Um, I happen to really like writing in first person. Um, a lot of my stories that I've written are in first person, and I think it's partly because I just like to imagine myself into the consciousness of one character and sort of interested in looking at everything through that, that character's lens. Um, I suppose one of these days I should try to write some sweeping big thing with like many, many perspectives, um, just to see if I can. But um, but anyway, in terms of you know, that balance between using details from your own life and, and making things up. I think sometimes when it's something you know nothing about, in order to make it more plausible, you actually have to use some details from your own life to kind of animate it and give it, um, you know. No, forgive me, I'm gonna break in for just a yeah. second because I, I, there may be some people here who haven't read the book and I, I, I think- Probably I not, think, it came out today. I think in very, in very, very <laughs> brief, Spoiler free synopsis might be might be. Might be. The no, I want to make my oh, good. myself. Oh, good. Um, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know how good is the flap copy. Um, I wrote it. I wrote it. Oh no, then you read. Then read the flap copy. Then read the flap. No, 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 no. But I want to hear your summary. All right, all right, all right. Because uh, you have to be careful not to get too much. It's inspired one. by Samantha Smith, which is another. Yeah, yeah. So I was so dealing who, with historical. Who, who is Samantha Smith? Samantha Smith, for those of you who are Gen X may remember, or older, those of you who are younger probably don't remember her, but um, in 1982, a little girl named Samantha Smith, who lived in Maine, um, wrote a letter to the Yuri Andropov, who was then the head of the Soviet Union, and her letter, her letter, her actual letter is really amazing, by the way, it's like, hi, or like, dear Mr. Andropov, my name is Samantha Smith, I'm 10 years old, congratulations on your new job, are you going to start a nuclear war? Um, it's amazing, I mean, you can, it's amazing. Um, and and Dropoff wrote back, and his letter is one of the greatest pieces of propaganda you'll ever read. There's this long, um, rambling thing about how he, she reminds him of Becky Thatcher and Mark Twain's, um, you know, this, this sort of, he's turning into this American archetype. Um, anyway, so he wrote back saying, no, we would never start a war first. We are a peace-loving nation and blah, blah, blah. And then he invited her and her parents to visit the USSR in the summer of 1983. So, uh, the Smiths. The Smiths went to Moscow. The Smiths went to Moscow and what was then Leningrad, and uh, they went for this two-week tour. It was 
highly publicized. I was watching it all on TV at home. I, um, she was two years older than I am, so I was eight when this all happened. I never met her. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and you know, she lived in Maine. But she captured my imagination because she was you know, my contemporary. I was very worried about nuclear war. I think most kids my age and a little older were. Um, and so I was just really impressed by her. Anyway, she was everywhere for about a year, and then she was on this TV show called Lime Street with Robert Wagner. Um, only a few episodes, because then she died in a plane crash, and quite suddenly. Um, in real life, her remains were found. There's no question that she's actually dead. Um, her father died in the crash, but her mother is actually still alive, um, apparently. Um, but anyway, that was the, that historical seed was the, was the, um, where the idea for this book came from. And it's not a Ramana Club, this is not a fictionalized version of that story. That was just a jumping off point. I thought, well, what if, what if two girls who are best friends both wrote to end drop off because they were worried about nuclear war? And what if only one of them got a response? And only one of them was invited to, you know, be the child peace ambassador. And I thought, well, how would that fame change this friendship? And I also thought, well, how, I wanted to play with these sort of Cold War themes, but take them to the smaller scale of a, of a friendship, the sort of rivalry and the way people define themselves against another, because so much of um, the Cold War was a kind of defining yourselves in opposition to something else. It's like, what does it mean to be American? It meant we weren't communists, and we weren't Russian, you know, it's, um, and, and I think sometimes friendships can be like that too, you're sort of defining yourself against the other person. So I was just sort of playing these Cold War themes on, the, on this kind of smaller scale, but that's where the idea came from. And I put my two girls in D.C., not Maine, partly, again, because I know Washington, I grew up there, but, but mostly because, again, because I was playing the Cold War themes, I wanted the book to take place in the two superpower capitals. So a good chunk of the book is in D.C., and a good chunk of the book is in Moscow, because, of course, Moscow is the capital of the other superpower before the Soviet Union collapsed and was no longer a superpower. And, um, anyway. So... So, so that how was much of it is autobiographical. Right. right. Um, well, very little, well, so the childhood sections, um, almost none of it, because, you know, um, I'm not giving too much away. You know now that her, her older sister dies. Um, I'm the oldest of three sisters. They're both alive and well. Um, my parents never got divorced. My father's not British. She's from Alabama. Um, my mother, who's dead, um, I mean, it's, I'm sad she's not here to see this, but this book I dedicated to her, was nothing like the mother of this book. I mean, if anything, my father used to complain that my mother had no sense of mortality, like mm -hmm. she was just such a risk taker. Um, so in some ways, the mother in this book is like the polar, <laughs> the polar opposite of my own mother. But I, um, once I had the idea for the book, I thought, okay, I want to tell it from the perspective of the, the marginalized character, the girl who's left behind by the famous friend, and, and then I found myself asking why she cared so much, why she was still sort of hung up on what she perceived as betrayal. And so I thought, well, of course, she has to have a family that's haunted by loss. She has to. So I kind of, I just invented her whole backstory. Um, and, and I don't know, it was quite intuitive, like the, imagining the film projections of the dead. I mean, it all, I can't, there are certain things about the process of writing that can be a little mysterious. You're just sort of working and you. You follow the sounds of words. I mean, some of the central metaphor of the book, defection is kind of emotional abandonment, came quite intuitively just from writing sentence. You know, like that that sentence, the first defector was my sister, came out, and then I was like, ah, defector, defective, feeling defective. You know, you play with language, and then these things come out of just the words themselves. So um, that was a happy accident, but um, it was a good accident. <laughs> um, so the you know what is autobiographical is the world of Washington. I mean, I grew up in Washington, in Northwest Washington. I grew up in that era, the 1980s Washington, or my it's my childhood. I grew up in a very particular milieu where everybody's parents were, you know, um, in the administration or big deal journalists or you know, kind of <coughs> very much part of the power circles of D.C. or something, um, and. Uh, so that, you know, the world, the setting is autobiographical. I know that world very well. The family, the narrators, life is like completely invented. 
Um, but then I lived in Moscow for two years in the 90s, and so in many ways the observations that Sarah has of Moscow are probably the most autobiographical ones in the world. Because, anyway. You know, if wealthy is a really smart thing. Um, she probably said a lot of smart things. Yeah, this is one of many. Um, so, you know, I don't think you have to really know the time or the place in order to write, but I mean, the <coughs> time and place, whether it be 12th century Japan, which is impossible to visit, or you know, a logging camp where you may, as Dora said, you don't have to work in a logging camp to write your logging camp novel. However, I don't think, says Ms. Dora, you can write convincingly about an emotion you haven't felt. No, totally. And I think that's a really smart and useful distinction. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not about getting the number of windows in a castle rack rent wrong. Yeah, it's about, do you know love? Do you know envy? No do you know fear? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, if the answer to any of those is, oh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I love it, but no fear, then you don't write about that. I know fear. <laughs> I, I and know, I know fear. Yeah. Um, so, yes. I, it's a little, in that sense, it's not totally unlike acting. You know, if you, some actor plays a character who's nothing like them, <coughs> you sort of imagine, like, well, how would I feel if my baby sister died? Oh, I probably feel not unlike I felt when my mother died. Yeah, but you know, yeah. you, you um, the, the, it's true. You have to kind of channel the appropriate emotional life of the character. But I also think it's not so much oh, you can imagine places, but you can't imagine emotions. I think part of it is that if if you're inventing a lot, it usually helps if there's something in there that you know really well because it helps you sort of run. So, like I said, I invented this whole family and this mother and, and this dead sister and all this stuff, but I think it helped that I was, the, the world they lived in visually is so familiar to me, you know, so I had some, um, it was sort of helpful me to have some uh, signposts or something. Um, but they became very real to me. I mean, I can picture my mother. I can hear her, picture her. Um, she's very specific to me in my, in my mind. But, you know, I have, I have a lot of a very specific question, but I actually want to ask you one like a general one, and then maybe let, let's talk to let's talk yeah. to everybody. Um, yeah. I, I, I this, for me somehow the theme of the evening is is how did you do this? Um, I think a well first any finished book is remarkable. I'll walk into a Barnes and Noble and just look at acres and acres of books with the knowledge that you know a lot of them are not very good, but I still think was all these people finish these books. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and I, I think there is something particularly remarkable about writing a first novel. Because once once you've published a first novel, then you have become, or this is true of me anyway, then you become in your own mind somebody who writes novels. And the, novel, the next one is easy, but it begins to feel like something you plausibly do. That, that, that sense of yourself as a imposter and a hack and a fraud and all that has been replaced by well, a different I century think it's sort of like childbirth, where you're like, you forget really quickly how painful it was. Yeah. So you're like, sure, I'll get pregnant again. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I haven't actually had a baby. My middle sister just had her third. And that's the way she described it. She's like, hmm, oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot that giving birth is like the worst thing. You just, <laughs> yeah.